Okay. Good morning and uh, welcome to EMRA 2021 workshop on uh, EU marine robots and applications. That is uh, virtually hosted in uh, Pisa, Italy by, by ISME. I am uh, Riccardo Costanzi and I shared the organization of the event with uh, my colleague and friend uh, Alessandro Ridolfi. Uh, this is a strange edition of uh, EMRA. Last year, we did not meet because of the COVID-19. And uh, this year, the EMRA organizing committee strongly wanted the organization of the event, uh, not to lose uh, for the uh, second year this great possibility of meeting for uh, our community. Well, having more than 200 registrations confirms uh, also that the that also the community wanted that uh, so few words about the program in this uh, welcome uh, two keynote uh, will open the two days of uh, works today and tomorrow uh, there will be presented more than uh, 15 uh, youth funded uh, uh, projects there will be a session dedicated to the project Europe uh, EU Marine Robots uh, this, uh, this afternoon, a uh, project that involves a uh, lot of us, uh, the, most of the community. And uh, we will have two industrial talks, one about uh, the research carried out in the SRS company and the other one about the uh, Kawasaki company. We will have a, a virtual social event uh, later the, this afternoon, uh, an aperitivo uh, sponsored by the project um, Matrak ACP. And for the first time, we will have a, a session dedicated to marine robotics European policy uh, that will take place later this, uh, this morning. So uh, a special thank to project sponsoring the event, Matra KCP and the Euro, uh, EU Marine Robots and uh, all the people involved in the organization. And now I leave the stage to uh, the other co-organizer, Alessandro, and then to uh, Giovanni Indiveri, the uh, ISME director. Over. Thank you very much, Riccardo. Thanks for the introduction. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Alessandro Ridolfi from uh, ISME, and I will give you now just a few uh, technical details and some information about this uh, uh, workshop. As you know, uh, this year, the event will be fully virtual. This is the first time, and we also hope the, the last one. Uh, after each uh, session, so after the speeches, we will have uh, uh, some uh, discussions. So uh, please, you can, uh, you can ask for uh, some clarifications to the speaker uh, during the open discussion sessions. Uh, all the speeches and the questions will be managed by uh, some chairs, and we thank them uh, very much, uh, helping us in the organization. Concerning the questions, uh, you have two uh, options. You can raise your hand uh, when you would like to ask for uh, a question, or you can put the question directly in the chat box. So. Uh, everybody should be able to use the chat and you, put, you can put there the questions. All the questions, as I said, will be managed by the chairs, so they will decide uh, the questions to, 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 to be asked to the speakers, uh, and they will uh, so uh, take the questions from the chat or uh, will ask you to, uh, to talk if you uh, raised your hand. 
As concerning the, the videos, we will try to have them uh, switched off as much as possible to limit uh, bandwidth issues. But of course, we will uh, switch on with pleasure uh, all our uh, videos during, for instance, the social event, so the aperitivo, as said by Ricardo, or during the um, breaking rooms. When we will have some uh, breaks, so during the morning, at lunchtime, and in the afternoon, uh, Ricardo and myself, we will, uh, we will uh, open some dedicated uh, breaking rooms. So you will have the opportunity to move in a secondary room to talk with uh, your friends and colleagues. Uh, we will uh, uh, close all the breaking rooms when the new session will, uh, will start. Uh, in order to go in a breaking room and to talk with your friends and colleagues, you can use, for instance, the chat during the day. So you can use the one-to-one -one chat and you can say, for instance, okay, let's go in the breaking room number three during the next break to have a, a talk and some greetings. Finally, as you probably have already seen, uh, we are recording the event. So we will then make the link available to all of you and to all the people who cannot attend today. Thanks again. And I would leave the speech to Giovanni Indiveri, the head of ISM. So yes, thank you, Alessandro. Thanks also to Ricardo and to all of you. Um, I guess most of us uh, know each other already. I am Giovanni Indiveri. I <clears throat> am since a few months the director of ISME. And actually this is one of the first occasions to, to, to be very proud of because um, the, 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 is, the EMRA event is, is I think a, a very important pillar in the, um, in the, in, in the area. Uh, unfortunately, as it was already said, it's, it's only um, virtual, but nevertheless, I hope this will be a good occasion to, to get in touch and to strengthen the, 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 the knowledge between uh, potential partners also for future, for future work. Um, I would like to thank very much the organizing committee of EMRA that is made by a large group of colleagues uh, throughout the, all Europe. And of course, I would like to thank the, the, the uh, attendees and the participants um, to the workshop. I, the, the program is, is very rich, uh, very interesting, and the number of participants apparently um, demonstrate that there is, there is interest for this. Um, last but not least, I would like to thank uh, the local organizers from the uh, Pisa and, and Florence nodes of, of ISME. Um, I'm sure the, the, the event will, be, uh, will work out fine and it's, it's uh, thanks to their efforts and work that, that this is uh, very likely to happen. Um, I won't go any further time schedule is tight. Um, I'm sure we will have a chance to talk over more uh, in the next few days. That's all. Okay, thank you very much, Giovanni. And uh, let's start. So uh, the I, I, I leave the speech to uh, Antonio Pascual. Uh, to introduce the morning session and then let's go okay <laughs> please antonio hello good morning everyone uh my name is antonio i'll be chairing the keynote and h2020 project session this morning first of all a word of praise to the organizers for putting together such an exciting program this is great so now without further ado I would like to introduce Richard Camilli uh, that will uh, present, give a presentation on the topic of great machines think alike. And then there's something else, the rest of the title. Um, 
is currently uh, an associate scientist with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, Department of Applied Ocean Physics and Engineering, and he has a vast array of interests in situ sensor and instrumentation design, marine and cognitive robotics, chemical oceanography, and then all the way to multi-resolution concurrent mapping and deep water archaeology. So um, Richard, if you don't mind, your presentation will last for 20 minutes and then there will be a 10 minute question and answer uh, subsession. I personally uh, would prefer if those wishing to ask questions would raise their hands. In case that does not work, then please go ahead and write in the chat room. So uh, Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, and uh, can I share screens here? Yes, now you should be able to share. Okay, great. Hopefully you can see a screen. Yes. Okay, wonderful. So uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's my honor and a pleasure to speak here. Uh, this morning, I'll provide a brief and hopefully interesting overview of a research program that culminated in, the, uh, in an expedition to autonomously explore an active underwater volcano in the Greek Cyclades. Um, this program was initiated as part of NASA's Planetary Science and Technology from Analog Research Program. It's also known as PSTAR. And this focuses on the development of technologies for detection of exobiology, which is life on other worlds. Uh, our team's research objective has been to develop underactuated methods of autonomy for cooperative exploration in potentially hazardous ocean worlds. So now, other than Earth, you may be asking yourself, what is an ocean world and why is that important? And for more than 40 years, a growing body of evidence uh, has accumulated suggesting that the earth is not unique in having liquid water. Uh, this has profound implications for the possibility of life existing uh, or having existed in, uh, on planets beyond our earth. Now, one of the more exciting uh, finds that has occurred uh, actually just a few years ago during a Cassini fly-through of geysers in the southern, southern polar region of Enceladus, and that's one of Saturn's moons, um, they found that like Jupiter's moon Europa, a liquid uh, water ocean may exist beneath its icy surface. And these geysers, uh, they have chemistry similar to volcanic lakes here on Earth. And this is expanded our understanding of what is sometimes referred to as the Goldilocks zone. And uh, that basically uh, is a shorthand for environments that are suitable for life within our solar system. But this is also potentially important because uh, more, well, almost 5,000 exoplanets have been discovered in our galaxy since 1992. But you know, now that we know that these planets exist and these moons exist, how would we go about exploration for life within these ocean worlds? And uh, exploration missions currently require manual low-level planning and control uh, by remote human operators in order to collect and analyze samples. And this architecture is problematic for investigation of ocean worlds for multiple reasons. First, the two-way travel time uh, for radio communication between moons like Enceladus or Europa would be well over an hour. And unlike Mars, where a vehicle can safely park itself while waiting for instructions, robotic platforms swimming within an ocean may drift away from a given set point location and into potentially hazardous regions. Second, uh, many of the analytical sensors require direct contact for sample analysis and this places a heightened requirement on precise positioning. Additionally, Enceladus and Europa's ice caps in liquid oceans would be opaque to radio communication. On Europa in particular, the ambient radiation environment 
that's created by Jupiter would further limit bandwidth even at the surface. And although the gravitational constants uh, for these moons are significantly less than Earth or Mars, the tens of kilometers of ice thickness in these ice caps would exert pressure equivalent to anywhere between 100 meters and four kilometers water depth here on Earth. So from an engineering perspective, these constraints are similar to those faced by the marine robotics community. So over the last several years, our PSTAR team has focused on developing a minimalistic autonomy architecture that enables exploration in these remote and potentially hazardous subsea environments. Uh, our approach uses a, a fairly conventional nested exploration process uh, using heterogeneous uh, vehicle types and conducting, I guess what you could call a progressively finer scale investigation in areas that are calculated to provide increased information gain. And uh, for this approach to work, though, it requires coordinated path and activity planning and automated interpretation of state. So previously, my colleagues and I had experimented with non-deterministic mission plans. In the example that's shown here, uh, we basically wrote a mission for an autonomous underwater vehicle, in this case, the, the Sentry AUV, to conduct a survey and using a, a set of threshold criteria to find something interesting at a deep sea pingo site. Uh, this was out in the Pacific. And when the vehicle thought it found something interesting, it was instructed to report back via an acoustic link and ask permission before going in for a closer look. Uh, the reason that we had it uh, operate that way is that we were afraid that the vehicle would go rogue on us. Uh, in the instance shown here, the automated process created a a ranked target list and asked to go to the site indicated by the white arrow that uh, hopefully you can see here. And it turns out that this site was a seafloor vent site that had also been chosen by a scientist during a, an Alvin dive a few years earlier. And we know this because the sign in the upper left corner of this photograph here that was taken by the AUV uh, uh, has the scientist's name on it with a telephone number to call if his equipment was found. So, but now more recently, uh, Eric Timmons, who is a, an amazing student in my lab group, developed a model-based mission planner named Kirk, which optimizes resource constraints and risk allocation to plan feasible missions in challenging conditions. Uh, in the example shown here, Kirk was exploiting the variability in depth and water column currents uh, to help slingshot and underwater glider that was equipped with a, a payload mass spectrometer uh, to efficiently move from one survey location to the next. And this approach enabled a visitation rate of more than 70% of the goal locations, even when the water column currents uh, were approaching the maximum speed of the vehicle. And perhaps most importantly, this planner was able to generate and dispatch a vehicle mission in less than a minute and this enabled operation in highly dynamic environments that previously were intractable for manually scripted missions because they couldn't be generated rapidly enough. Now, in early 2018, we began testing Kirk with uh, heterogeneous vehicles, and this enabled us to globally optimize the campaign for the fleet. In this instance, Eric used his Kirk planner to generate and update simultaneous mission plans for three vehicles with very different performance envelopes and mission goals. And at the end of their respective missions, all three vehicles converged at the rendezvous location simultaneously. And you can see that in the, the signs 13 there. Now, building on this work, Ben Aiden, who's another amazing student in my group, expanded on the automated planning process by creating Spock. And this is a science planner that assimilates real-time sensor data with disparate classes of, of prior data. This can be historical data uh, that you pull out of the literature, but it, it uh, merges this information uh, uh, to infer relationships and predict locations of high value science sites uh, that have not previously been visited. And in late 2018, we used various chemical, biologic, 
biological, geological, and acoustic data. Uh, and uh, Spock's planning resulted in the discovery of one of the most prolific seafloor seeps in the Pacific margin of Costa Rica. And that's this site shown right here. Uh, and this uh, uh, seafloor photograph. But um, along with generating the statistical probabilities for each estimated source location, Spock can extract a relative measure of the impact of, of specific features on a site's overall probability. And this enables the planner to kind of learn as it goes to refine its estimates. And um, using this nested survey approach with Kirk and the Spock planners during this Costa Rica expedition, we were able to start with an initial survey area of over 10,000 square kilometers and rapidly narrow it down and identify targets with geo-referenced accuracy to within about plus or minus five meters. Uh, but uh, if we want to do automated sample collection and manipulation, this requires near field motion planning and operation at scales down to better than a centimeter. And so during this same expedition, we also made our first baby steps toward automating manipulation by fusing real-time uh, kinematic models of the ROV and manipulator. In this case, this is a, a seven-function seven uh, Schilling Titan IV uh, with 3D reconstruction of the scene. And the kinematic model relied on, on kind of standard joint encoder feedback and the workspace reconstruction was provided by a stereo optical camera system mounted on the upper light bar on the ROV's bow and a fisheye camera mounted to the manipulator's wrist. And uh, Gideon Billings, who's another excellent student member of our team from the University of Michigan, then integrated SiloNet. And this is a six degree uh, pose estimation process that he developed to identify ROV sampling tools using the monocular fisheye camera and provide real-time estimate of each tool's pose. And you can, if you notice it, uh, in this video, the fidelity of the modeled handled positions uh, despite the arm motion. And the April tags that are at the base of the tools here, uh, those were used for ground truth comparison of the pose estimates. Now, building on the, the results from these field experiments, we then set about developing an automated manipulation process for the Nereid under ice vehicle, or, or NUI for short. And unlike conventional ROVs, it uses an ultra thin fiber optic tether that is roughly the diameter of a human hair. And this has the advantage of allowing the vehicle to operate up to 20 kilometers away from the surface ship, but it requires that it carry its own battery power. And, uh, uh, this uh, uh, kind of generates some trade-offs. One is that to minimize the power draw, the vehicle uses a low power uh, custom built hydraulic manipulator arm that's equipped with poppet valves. And although it's highly efficient compared with other valve types, the poppet valves are notoriously poor in their unloading characteristics. And this uh, leads to imprecise control. Uh, also to minim minimize drag and conserve power, Nui is equipped with articulating doors that close during transit. And you can see the doors are open here. And uh, you see the manipulator is attached to the starboard door and uh, the stereo pair of cameras is attached to the port side door. And this creates a, a fairly complex work area. And with these additional degrees of freedom of motion of the, the cameras and the, the arm, uh, it, uh, uh, creates a, a variable range of motion and visibility and shadowing. Uh, so it's uh, uh, a fair bit more complex than a standard ROV uh, during its uh, operation. Now, a simple way to assist the, the estimation of the workspace configuration state uh, was that we just uh, equipped the vehicle's doors and arm and uh, the payload bay area with April tags. And uh, then uh, we generated artificial limits to the, the range of motion uh, using uh, position estimates that we derived from those April tags. And this was to prevent the arm from colliding with the vehicle hardware. 
Uh, then we built a ROS based state machine to step through the various tasks associated with grasping a tool, removing it from uh, its holster, uh, placing it at a sample location, uh, taking a sample and returning the arm to its stowed location. So we broke it down to uh, kind of primitive elements here. here. And uh, then using the state machine, we then refined the manipulation process using a, a hardware in the loop test bed. And uh, you can see the, the 3D scene reconstruction that's shown at the right. Uh, it's used to estimate the obstacles and the surface normal to environmental features of interest for the automated motion planner. And the left panel here shows a video capture of a manipulation task being executed. And you can notice that the, the process uh, accounts for the shape and pose of the tool so that it only lightly touched that rock that was balanced on its edge. And sampling tools such as push cores and slurp samples have varying contact parameters. Uh, so this process incorporation incorporates the motion policies uh, that enable the arm to actuate differing tools according to the specific requirements of the job. And uh, this, for example, is a, this is a tool that I built. It's, a, it's an underwater X-ray spectrometer. And uh, this tool requires placement with millimeter accuracy because its sensitivity attenuates rapidly with distance from the target. And that's just the nature of uh, X-rays uh, 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 transmitted through water. So uh, anyway, so now that we've built all these tools for a toolbox, what can we do with them? And back in 2012, my good friend Kostas Katsaros and I discovered these structures that you see here. They're called the, we call them the Callisti Limnes, which translated into English means most beautiful lakes. And they're gravity driven CO2 pools that occur on the flanks of the Santorini caldera. And the photos here really don't do justice to the phenomena because the pools. Uh, contain liquid opal about 10% by volume, and they shimmer like iridescent jewels. From an astrobiological perspective, uh, the, the discovery was important because it was its environmental chemistry is similar to what is thought to have existed on Earth during the dawn of life. And subsequent investigations of these pools revealed unusual classes of organisms that live on carbon dioxide, but without the benefit of photosynthesis. And uh, if you think about it, this might be a useful biochemical trick if you uh, are an organism swimming around on a dark ice covered moon in the outer regions of our solar system. Anyway, um, based on the Callisti Limnes discovery, our team's volcanologist, Dr. Dr. Uh, Evi Nomaku uh, suggested that the neighboring Colombo volcano would be an excellent place to trial some of our new technologies. Uh, this caldera is one of the most active volcanoes in this region of the world. And it's really interesting because the, the crater walls rise up from a depth of about 500 meters and the top rim uh, sits just below the sea surface. So it creates uh, an almost fully enclosed environment and it's a fairly treacherous area for exploration. And in November 2019, just before the pandemic uh, started, uh, we commenced operations at Colombo and we started using Ben and Eric's automated planners. And what you see here, this jagged white line uh, in the figure illustrates the path taken by the, the Nui vehicle during a dive mission generated by these automated planners. And the first science location right here that Nui visited resulted in the discovery of an entire field. Uh, the largest of the vents was named Spock's Candle, and this is what's uh, shown in the inset here. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, X-ray spectrometer that I'd built was damaged in the shipment, so uh, we were unable to use it during this expedition. And uh, at a subsequent science goal location, we decided to attempt a physical sample collection using our automated manipulation process. And uh, the sediments proved too unconsolidation, uh, too unconsolidated uh, for our initial attempts with a push core sampler. So we switched over to a slurp sampler. And uh, by this time, 
in the mission, the arm was experiencing a hardware glitch in the shoulder azimuth feedback. Uh, but the automated process was able to overcome this and complete the entire manipulation task in less than 20 seconds. Uh, as a benchmark for comparison, uh, this sampling process normally takes about a minute or two when it's done manually. Once we'd met all of the mission requirements that we'd set out to uh, complete, uh, we had the opportunity to, to attempt sampling using natural language. Uh, this process was developed by my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Matt Walter, and uh, it allowed the NUI pilot to issue a, a short set of high level verbal commands, such as go to the sample location, execute sampling now, uh, stow the arm, and here you can see the natural language interface in action with the arm taking uh, another sample and then returning to the stowed position. And I would say that if there's one main limitation or, or lesson that we learned uh, in these expeditions is that real world environments can pose unexpected imaging challenges. Uh, in, in, in the ideal conditions with good water clarity and light and the lighting is good, uh, standard visual methods can work quite well. And this is demonstrated by the really dense point cloud uh, in this panel uh, that we recorded in Costa Rica. Uh, but we often operate in underwater environments, which are less optimal visually. Uh, in the image on the bottom here, uh, this was taken in Colombo, and the seafloor was covered with this thick uh, microbial mat layer, which uh, provided very sparse features and was also easily stirred up into the water column, resulting in, in poor lighting and, and high backscatter. And, uh, as an architect friend likes to remind me, lighting is everything. And so with that in mind, we're now preparing for an upcoming cruise in September, where we'll attempt to use the X-ray spectrometer and are carefully modeling the, the workspace lighting field. Now, additionally, uh, to aid our language and motion planning processes, we're also experimenting with using gaze tracking to assist with understanding human intent. And what you see here, that little circle that's uh, jumping around, uh, that's where we're tracking the pilot's eye movement during a manipulation task. And with any luck, we'll have some new results to present in the coming year. Um, I'm probably over time here, but I'd like to close by acknowledging that this research would not have been possible without generous contributions from several funding sources and the hard work of all the PSTAR members uh, and several of who are listed here. Uh, so with that, I, Thank you for your attention. And if there's time, I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you very much. So now there's a um, 10 minute slot, more or less, for questions and answers. It's up to you. I personally prefer to see the hands being raised. But if you have trouble doing that for some reason, uh, or because the computer is not cooperating, please write your questions in the chat box. Thank you. So questions from the audience, please. I, I can start with a quick question. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation um, because I, this is some groundbreaking word, work. Um, and also you go from the lab to testing the water. Um, I am involved in a European project where we are scheduled to operate gliders and Theo from Greece will talk about that on detecting radioactivity underwater. So, I, I was quite intrigued with the methods that you used to do the planning without consuming too many resources. So maybe this is not the right place for me to ask this, but if you could please direct me to some of the references at the later stage, I would greatly appreciate that. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay. The other question is, what, what gliders were you using? The Slocum? Yes, uh, using the Slocum gliders. And uh, uh, what we've done is, is kind of, um, uh, well, modified them significantly. So uh, yeah. in, in the case of the, the one slide that I showed, we were using a, uh, uh, I built a mass spectrometer into the glider. All right, all right. And, uh, and in, in this uh, particular instance here, uh, I didn't get too far down into the details, but you see the, the red flag icons here. Those were um, where uh, we equipped a, the glider with uh, uh, a uh, uh, DVL ADCP and also an, an imaging sonar. And uh, we use that to detect uh, uh, acoustic anomalies in the water column that okay. we were able to um, uh, translate that into uh, uh, identifying uh, seep sites. Thank you. I see that Pere Ridal has a question to ask. Hello. Uh... Hello everyone. Nice to meet you again, Richard. Good to see uh, you. <laughs> yeah, it's it has been very interesting your presentation. I'm very curious about the autonomous manipulation that you are bringing uh, here to real applications. I'm I'm wondering uh, because you you are using the the tether in this vehicle you were showing, which part of the manipulation it's uh, fully autonomous, and and if there is any part which is driven by the by the user because I guess detecting the, the targets where you want to bring the, the tools and these things, is, is this uh, already autonomous right now? Or, 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 or you are managing some autonomy with some manually driving uh, target detection? So the, the, uh, uh, the, the target identification, uh, so when the, when the mission plans are created with, with uh, Spock and Kurt, for instance, uh, those are generated before the vehicle goes in the water. And then there's the op opportunity to continually replan the missions as we go. The, the Nui vehicle, it, it has that fiber optic tether so that it can, and it's, it oftentimes breaks. So uh, what we um, have to have uh, as a standby is that the vehicle can switch into an autonomous mode. We used it in the, in the uh, ROV mode, uh, uh, for these operations, uh, in part because the, the computational requirements uh, for the manipulation and the scene reconstruction required that we feed the data up to the top side and run it on computers there because we, we just couldn't fit them in the bottles. Uh, there, we had uh, uh, a significant um, uh, number of computers working uh, to make that happen. So it was an easier way to do it. Uh, our hope is to eventually get to the point where we can have it all built into the, the vehicle itself. So what, what type of, um, of let's say, task are, are you doing? So I guess you are putting tools next to some areas of geological interest or something like this. So what, what are the typical operations that you are trying to do with the manipulator? But with the manipulator, uh, what we try to do is, is uh, stay clear of, of complex grasps. And so we try to simplify that. The, the grasps are, are some of the uh, most difficult things to accomplish. So by uh, focusing on using tools with the standard T handles, it makes the job significantly easier. Uh, in terms of the types of tools that we use, uh, push cores, uh, that uh, uh, X-ray spectrometer that I, I showed and um, uh, I'll show you a little detail on that. Uh, you'll notice that it, it's equipped with a T-handle here, yeah. and it also has uh, this, it's basically it's a, a, a shock absorber, a compliant shock absorber, so that if we do overshoot with the, the arm, uh, that uh, we don't uh, smash things up too badly. Yeah. So um that that gives us uh, about a centimeter or two of compliance which is helpful okay uh, and what do you think is the next challenge for manipulation underwater in the type of application <laughs> you are facing 
So one of the big uh, challenges that we're facing right now is, is uh, again, it goes back to that, that the lighting and the reconstruction where uh, effectively, you know, we're trying to create this, this 3D reconstruction, but at best it's about two and a half D. And we have uh, a very, very limited field of view. And so when we are attempting to do manipulations, uh, there are uh, many of the regions in the workspace are shadowed. And so we don't have a good uh, estimate uh, of, you know, if, if there is a, uh, 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 an obstacle there or if there, if there is an obstacle, what's behind it. And so one of the things that we're uh, looking at, uh, we're, and this is where a, a Gideon is actively doing his work, uh, is uh, uh, using, a, the, as you say, the eye in hand with the, the camera on the, the end effector uh, to use that to uh, visually servo around and uh, create a, a more complete view uh, yeah. for manipulation. Okay, thank you very much. It has been really, really interesting. Thank you. Okay, so we have a question from Laura Matthew. I'm on mute. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so yeah. thank you for your presentation. Uh, I was just curious because you mentioned that you, yeah, basically the lights are quite a big problem. And I was uh, wondering what is your next step for, um, yeah, tackling this problem? Uh, so uh, part of that is, is, uh, it, it's kind of a uh, just simple geometry where you you try to minimize the amount of uh, volume that's uh, shared, uh, sort of visualization volume that's shared between the the camera uh, and the lights. And unfortunately, with with this vehicle, we don't have a great uh, uh, baseline separation. Uh, some of the other uh, techniques that that uh, we've been exploring is uh, 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 using other types of, of uh, filtering processes. And Oscar Pizarro, who's much better at, at uh, uh, scene reconstruction than I am, uh, he's uh, developed some planoptic techniques and, and other methods that are, are experimental. But um, uh, uh, anyway, there, uh, there's uh, active work by people other than me on that. and. Um, if you're interested, I'd be happy to uh, put you in touch with them. Okay, thanks. So uh, there's a question in the chat room from Koena Mukherjee from India. And she wrote down, manipulator is flexible link or rigid link type? Uh, it, it is a, a, a rigid uh, a hydraulic arm and uh, I'm not quite sure uh, what more to say on that. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, so, um, Vipul Garg, please. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this was a great presentation. Uh, I have a doubt. Uh, I saw the uh, robot and the uh, environment was equipped with markers. So, I think those markers were for the pose estimate. So I'm not uh, like I also you mentioned that there is a uh, visibility issue. So how you were able to detect those markers and what exactly the purpose they are fulfilling? Because there are plenty of the markers on the environment too. So um, I'll try and go back a couple of slides. Uh, were you referring to to these yes. uh, April tags? Yes. So. So in, in this case, uh, so uh, Gideon's silo net, uh, you can see that there is an image superimposed of a, a T handle uh, over the actual T handle. And uh, it's uh, this process, it's, it's uh, uh, use a, a convolutional neural network uh, to identify uh, uh, the object uh, and then estimate its pose and then it, it generates this model uh, uh, of the pose and it superimposes it on the image. And the, uh, in this case, the, those April tags are, are just used 
uh, to provide a ground truth for what the actual pose is. And uh, with Gideon's work, I mean, typically he can get the pose estimated correctly to within a couple of degrees. And, and you see there's, there's a little bit uh, of offset in this particular one, uh, but uh, uh, we also use that uh, to estimate the, uh, how the, the vehicle is configured when these doors open, because unfortunately the hydraulic rams that are here uh, uh, are not instrumented. So we can't uh, uh, really uh, get a good estimate of, of their, their position other than by visual methods. And so that's why we have these April tags kind of plastered all over the vehicle, including at the base of the, the arm here and uh, uh, right at the, the kind of the, the bow of the uh, payload bay. Okay, we have time for two more quick questions. There's one in the chat room and then the one by Raf Bashmeyer. So in the chat room by Theo Mertzimekis from Greece, does the X-ray spec use a source or a CRT? Has it been used on a glider? Uh, this, this one does use a source and uh, that's actually what failed. <laughs> um, and uh, I haven't used it on a glider. Thank you. Raf? Um, hi, Richard. Thank you for the Good presentation. Morning. It was very interesting. Um, I saw you used a couple of uh, approaches to the human machine interface with uh, natural language processing and, uh, and eye tracking uh, preliminary. What's your thought on that? What do you think is an efficient ship-based kind of uh, human machine interface? Where is that going? So with, with the eye tracking, it's really, uh, we found that uh, particularly with the natural language, uh, it's sometimes difficult to understand intent uh, when somebody says, you know, uh, uh, go to the, you know, square object, and if there's multiple square objects, it it really helps to uh, 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 narrow down uh, uh, the, this in the uh, content there. Um, and what we are looking at doing with that right now is is uh, in particular for uh, pilots uh, when we are uh, uh, when the pilots have to do coordinated manipulation and uh, or fly a vehicle um, while doing some kind of manipulation. So it's, it really comes down to uh, the, the pilot having uh, only two hands and uh, the verbal commands can be issued uh, very rapidly. Okay. okay, so we are about 10 minutes late, but I can't avoid reading the question from our good friend Giuseppe Casalino, Italy. Uh, is there any reason for using an hydraulic arm? Delicate operations like the ones seem could be better performed by an electric one. Yeah, so uh, good point. Um, this hydraulic arm, uh, uh, it, uh, its real advantage is that it's lightweight. Uh, it uh, uh, is fairly powerful for its, its given weight. Uh, it was, uh, this design was actually developed for the, the nearest vehicle that uh, went down to the bottom of the Marianas Trench. And uh, the, at, along with being lightweight uh, and strong, it's also incredibly energy efficient uh, so that it, uh, uh, it can hold its position with, with very, very little effort. The, the electric uh, uh, arms are, are really starting to make inroads now but uh, uh, this one is still uh, uh, by far more efficient than a standard electric arm. Thank you very much, Richard. To much you. to my regret, we have to stop now. Thank you very much. Thank very, you. Very excellent presentation. So we dive immediately into the next session, H2020 project session. And the first paper is called